Hey everybody and welcome back to the second lecture video for uh, week six. Again, we're looking at the legalization of Christianity. The first part we talked about Constantine and his role uh, and how he becomes emperor and how Christianity begins to fare better uh, from an overall perspective uh, under Constantine's rule. One of the important events that takes place during Constantine's reign as emperor is the, uh, the Council of Nicaea. Uh, which we'll get to in a moment. Let's begin by way of introduction. And we, we want to keep in mind about you know, what the emperor's role is within Christianity, right? Because this is actually going to be a transition for Constantine um, because he's, again, transferring from the Roman religion to Christianity in a sense, um, even though he's not converted at this point. Within the Roman religion, Constantine was held the title of Pontifex Maximus, which was essentially like the high priest of the Roman religion. And so the emperor had a direct role within Rome's religion. However, this is not the case with Christianity. This had not been the case with, with Christianity at all. Um, so Constantine is really transitioning from a place where he uh, automatically held a lot of power to where now Christianity is uh, very different. It's, it's developed its own system, its own beliefs, apart from the Roman Empire. You think about in different ways, right? We, we know that Christianity up to this point is really not a public religion. It's not seen, it's seen as being integral to the empire. And the same thing is sort of true with, you think about the, the, belief, the, the beliefs that Christians hold to, right? These are obviously independent from the values of the Roman Empire. Uh, you've got, of course, you've got leaders within Christianity that are making their own decisions rather than having to look to the emperor to, to be the one that handles decisions. And what turns out from that is that not every Christian agreed on the same thing. And Constantine, who really at this point is not all that familiar with Christianity outside of just knowing that it can help unify the empire, there's a lot that Constantine has to learn. And so uh, he, he's sort of in a position where he's got to learn on the fly, uh, we might say, uh, when it comes to Christianity. Uh, Constantine, again, didn't grow up studying Christianity per se. Um, he's not a scholar in that sense. He wasn't trained like some of the other, maybe the apologists we might think of. So th this, he's going to face some doctrinal issues that he's not very well acquainted with. Um, and this is something that Constantine sort of has to adjust to as he's transitioning from you know being so involved with uh, the Roman religion versus now getting involved with Christianity. And at the time, there was really one doctrinal issue that was the, the main thing at stake that'll come into play with the Council of Nicaea. And that is the fact that you, uh, that is the fact that people were disagreeing on the idea about do Christians worship one or two gods? And when you think about this, you've got issues with this in Scripture. Well, you don't have issues with this in Scripture per se, but some people looked at Scripture and developed... Uh, essentially, they looked at Scripture and, and didn't... Uh, they had some confusion about Scripture. There's some people that had confusion about Scripture on this issue. One of those passages comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. And I will... Pull that up in my Bible. So 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6, Paul says, But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by Him. Now to us that seems pretty, pretty easy for us to understand. We understand that, you know, Jesus is also God, even though He's distinct from the Father. But apparently there were people that were not so convinced of that. So when they read 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6, there were some, maybe, maybe new converts, Christians, Christianity, or, or there were just some Christians that thought that when they read 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6, that there was only one God, the Father. Um, and the Father is the only God. And that would uh, not include Jesus or the Holy Spirit. But then again, people took that passage, but then they tried to compare it with John chapter 1, verse 1, 
which talks about that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, the Word there being a reference to Jesus. And so there's this whole, there's this debate going around about, you know, whether or not Christianity, do they, do they worship one God or, or, or are we worshiping two gods? You know, if they are two separate beings, then it means that Christians are, are not worshiping one God at all, um, is the thinking of some. And so you think about how that plays into the role about handling, uh, you know, the Roman pagans in the temples where they worship. And Christians, they called out the fact that they worship multiple gods. And the point being is that now if Jesus and God are two separate gods, we might say, the idea is then how, are, how is Christianity really all that different from the Roman religion? Because the Roman religion worships multiple gods. At the same time, you've got the idea that you know if Jesus Christ is not really God, which is what some people were saying, he, he's a lesser form of it, then, then Christ is lesser than God the Father. And so you've got this issue that's being debated about whether or not you know, the, the, uh, the singleness of God, you know, whether or not Christians worship one God or two gods, that's a, that's a big debate that's going on right now. Not, not just among non-Christians and Christians, but this is going on uh, among Christians as well. And one of the main proponents of uh, the, the, one of the main, I guess what we might say, one of the main instigators of this discussion uh, comes from a man named Arius, who is at this point one of the, uh, one of the leaders in the church in Alexandria. Now let's talk about Arius a little bit. Um, when it comes to him at, in his biography, we might say a lot of what we have about him comes from his opponents, and you, you'll begin to see why that is in a moment. But from what we can understand is that Arius is born somewhere in North Africa around 250 AD. Uh, supposedly he took a harsh stance towards persecution or rather, he supposedly took a harsh stance against um, remitting Christians who had lapsed during persecution. We talked about that with Novation last week. Well, Arius sort of takes Novation's side, we might say, in that. He, he's pretty harsh about the readmission of Christians who had lapsed. This obviously gets him in, in controversy right off the bat with the church because Novation, of course, was essentially kicked out. Um, Arius is sort of... Uh, deals with the same thing, but later on he's readmitted back to the church in Alexandria, but as a presbyter. And Arius was known to be a very good speaker, and he was thought to be an intellectual as well. He was a good debater, what his opponents remembered about him. Um, and because of this, he actually becomes pretty popular among the people of Alexandria, which is going to play a, a large role with uh, this whole debate in a moment. And of course, Arius' popularity, popularity, again, will sort of heighten the division and, and will uh, cause the debate to become more heated, we might say, uh, and more divisive. And so let's talk about Arius' teaching. And this, a lot of his teaching, his, his, a lot of what we're focusing on is his ideas about deity because that's what the debate is about. Does, do Christians worship one or two gods? Well. According to Arius, God was wholly singular. And what is meant by that is just that God the Father is so unique, He's so high above man that man cannot really comprehend what it means that God is wholly singular. Um, which sort of seems ironic because he's, he's trying to explain it that way, or he's trying to really explain his ideas, but at the same time he's kind of saying that man can't comprehend uh, the, the single nature of God. So it sort of seems like he's defeating his own purpose, but he, he goes on to explain anyway, though, that because God the Father is so unique and so separate, there is a separation between God and Christ, from God the Father and Christ, so they're not necessarily the exact same being or on the exact same level. Instead, what Arius stated was that God is, uh, that Jesus was really a lesser version of God. And he's a lesser version because Christ instead was the first of all creation. So if Christ was created, then he is not true deity. And 
At the same time, though, Arius stated that Christ was also eternal. He was created, but he was eternal. And the reasoning for that is that Christ was created before time began. And, and that may be a little bit hard to understand, but he tried to argue that Christ was both created and that he was, in a sense, eternal because he was created before time. And one of the statements that's often attributed to Arius was the phrase that's there on the screen, there was a time when he, referencing Jesus, was not. Now, he did emphasize that Christ was, he, he did emphasize that Christ was a creature, that he was created, but that he did have a role that was beyond everything else that God had created. So Christ was created, but he was created to be higher than the angels. And so, you know, Christ is not another angel, he's just higher than the angels. And part of Arius' reasoning about this was that if Christ was actually deity, then that actually lessens the meaning of his sacrifice on the cross and really his obedience to God. Because in Arius' mind, if Christ is real, really deity, it doesn't mean very much for Christ to be obedient to himself or to... Um, sacrifice on behalf of his self, and that, that, and, and that he benefits from that. And so for Arius, it just it simply means in his mind that he thinks that the, the sacrifice of Christ is lessened, and that Christ, uh, again, his obedience is really sort of um, undermined if he was, was deity in the full sense that God the Father is. And his ideas are going to become known as Arianism. And what he was really trying to do was defend the idea that Christianity was monotheistic. In the sense that, you know, if Christians are monotheistic, then God the Father can only truly be deity. Christ has to be on a level lower than him. And at first it's sort of a subtle uh, difference between the two. Uh, maybe not so much to us, but for them back then, uh, for a lot of people, it was sort of a subtle difference. Constantine would have thought this to be a subtle difference between the two. But nevertheless, it's a pretty big controversy among a lot, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, writers, of Christian, writers of Christianity at the time. And so people that held to the ideas of Arius were called Arians, and his teachings were called Arianism. And this is not the same, answer, this is not the same Arianism as the, uh, the idea of, that, that was promoted with you know, Nazi Germany with the idea of uh, you know, the white race being superior to all other races. That's a, that's a different Arianism. This Arianism deals with the deity of, of God and the deity of Christ. So Arius is teaching this in the city of Alexandria. And this catches wind of a bishop in Alexandria, the bishop of Alexandria at the time, named Alexander. And he's going to respond to this. And one of the things that he points out is that if Jesus was actually created, then that means that Christians are now worshiping the creation more than the Creator. Which if you keep in mind Romans chapter 1 verse 25, that's a list of some of the things that Paul calls the Gentiles out for. One of the things that he points out about the Gentiles in Romans 1 verse 25 is that they worship the Creator more, they worship the creature more than the Creator. And so now, if Arius is correct, then Christians have fallen into the same problem that Paul said about the Gentiles in Romans 1 verse 25. In addition to it, Alexander simply responded and said that if Jesus was created, then how could he be, then how could he be the, uh, you know, if Jesus was created, then how could he redeem man from his sin? So if he was created, you have the concern that Christ might not have been perfect. And those are two of the main arguments that Alexander responded to um, when it came to the teaching of, of Arius. Alexander recognizes it, that it's a problem, so he calls for a council of bishops in, in the uh, local region to meet. And this occurs in 318 AD. They come to the decision that uh, Arius is wrong in his teachings. He can't teach it anymore. He's pronounced to be a heretic. And then it appears like everything has settled because the council has made a ruling. Arius at this point seems to be the only person or seems to be the only uh, major proponent of this. But things change pretty rapidly after this decision. Arius is not going to keep quiet about it. Arius goes and tries to find allies to support him. And it turns out that he has a lot of allies. 
or at least a number of them, to make this into a, a major decision, a major debate. And it turns out that Arius gains a lot of followers or, or has a lot of allies, we might could say, from some of the other bishops that are in the eastern Mediterranean region. And I'm going to pull up a map real quick. I'm going to make myself small and make that map bigger. So, again, we're talking about Alexandria, right? And you see the cursor there hovering over the city of Alexandria. This is where, this is where all this is taking place, Arius Alexander in the city of Alexandria. Well, it turns out that Arius has a lot of support from some of the bishops up in the eastern Mediterranean region, which is essentially what is today Turkey, what then was Asia Minor, and some of the places in Palestine and even into parts of Armenia. And, and a little bit further to the east. So, sort of in this area, not everybody, but um, Arius gains a lot of support from some of the bishops in the eastern portion of the Roman Empire. It turns out that some of these bishops as well uh, had been trained under uh, had been trained under Arius. And so... Let me go back and let me f figure that out real quick. Make that full screen. There we go. So Arius, actually, he gains a lot of support from them, and there's a couple reasons why. One, because apparently Arius had trained a lot of these people. Arius was actually a teacher at Antioch for a time before he went to Alexandria, and some of the bishops that were promoted in that area had been students of Arius. And so naturally they supported their teacher and they took his side in the matter. And so they wrote letters to the church in Alexandria essentially trying to um, plead on his behalf and to really to denounce Alexander as the true heretic rather than Arius. At the same time, because Arius is so popular, you've got public demonstrations in the streets that uh, essentially are saying that Arius is really the true teacher, Alexander is not, and they want Arius to be reinstated. And so, uh, again, you know, you're starting to see Christianity become a, a much more public religion, we might could say. It's not being confined to the home or just within the, you know, within the catacombs where they're gathering, but you're starting to see Christianity a lot more in the public sphere now under the reign of Constantine. And so a lot of churches are going to debate uh, about this. This becomes a major debating point. And, you know, it's one thing if this is a minor issue, but in reality this is a doctrinal issue because you're talking about the deity of Christ uh, and whether or not his sacrifice, uh, the, the meaning that it held with him being deity. So you've got a, a pretty important decision being made here. Um, and so Arius does have his allies. Now we move on and we'll talk about how Constantine plays a role within it. And for Constantine, you have to keep in mind that when it came to Arianism, this is a regional problem. We keep in mind that Constantine, you know, controlled the West at the time. So this, is ta this map is drawn after the uh, time of Constantine. We'll zoom in. Right, so Constantine at, at this point, before he takes on Licinius to the east, you know, he controls Spain, Gaul, uh, what is Great Britain today, Rome, and then most of the coast of North Africa up to around the region of Penta, Polis. And there's not really a lot of debate going on about Arianism in the west. And so while Constantine is learning about Christianity more from the west, it looks a little bit different in the east because of this major debate. But as Constantine is moving closer towards the east, he begins to recognize the problem exists. Right after he defeats Licinius uh, at Byzantium or Constantinople, he's essentially at the heart of what is the Eastern Roman Empire. And this is where he's going to hear about the challenges that are being promoted by Arius to the churches there. And in reality, Constantine's plan is going to be affected by this, or, it, or it's come under threat by this, because at this point, you have to take into mind that Constantine's entire purpose 
was that he wanted to unify the empire in part based on Christianity. So it seems like his plan is under attack because if this ideology that Arius is promoting is dividing the church, you don't have unity in the church, you can't have unity among the people. And Constantine essentially just saw this as a small matter of theology, but it's important to uh, settle the matter because um, you can't have unity without this, with, with this religious division going on. So Constantine decides to do something new, and that is to step in on the matter. And at this point, no Roman emperor has really gotten himself involved with the affairs of Christianity outside of just persecuting the church. But this is actually something new because Constantine steps in and what he does is that he sends a delegation to Alexandria led by a man named Hosius, uh, the bishop of Cordoba, which is located in Spain. And essentially the contents of that delegation or, or the, the words that were given to the delegation to speak uh, to the church in Alexandria was that Alexander needed to find some way to get peace restored in the region. And it does show that Constantine, Constantine acknowledged that there was a disagreement about deity, but he also emphasized that a quick resolution needed to, be, uh, needed to take place to figure out the issue. In fact, Constantine basically phrased it in the sense that you know, he wanted a quick resolution so that way he could go back to sleep and not have to worry about what was going on. And Constantine decides to uh, put in place a final council to settle the issue. But this council is not going to be local in nature. It's going to be universal in nature for Constantine uh, because he, he feels that that's really going to help settle the issue if the entire, you know, what is, you know, if all the churches within the empire can agree on an issue, that'll settle the matter rather than just having it, this be a local decision. That's the thought of Constantine. So again, this is an important moment in the history of not just the Roman Empire, but also in the history of Christianity, because the first time you've got the emperor, again, asserting himself into the doctrinal matters of the church. And this becomes important because this sets a precedent for other emperors to get involved following after him. And so now at this point, the internal affairs of the church are becoming a, uh, a necessary component for the state to deal with. So now we're starting to see Christianity leaving its private space and starting to become more involved in the public sphere and, and, and sort of taking the place of what uh, Roman paganism had been for so long to the Roman Empire. So the council is going to be held uh, in 325 and... and, and Again, this is the Council of Nicaea. It's, it's planned by Constantine. Um, it was originally going to be held in uh, Ancyra, which had a twofold purpose behind that. One, one purpose of this council uh, originally was going to be to celebrate and to commemorate Constantine's victory over Licinius, which we keep in mind that under Licinius, Christians have been in, had been persecuted, even though Licinius and Constantine had agreed on a policy of toleration towards Christians. Licinius went back on that, and Licinius had persecuted Christians, put them in prison. And so once Constantine defeated Licinius, Christians were freed from prison and from persecution. And so Christians naturally wanted to commemorate Constantine's victory because it, it signaled to them their physical freedom. At the same time, there was a debate going on about the date of Easter. And there were, essentially, there were just different churches practicing the holiday at, the same, at, at different times. Of course, Easter comes from a pagan holiday. It's not naturally Christianity. Uh, it was not naturally Christian in nature, but it was, it was a holiday that, that Christians sort of adopted and, and made their own. I know in the King James Version, I know the book of Acts talks about, uh, there's a word... I can't remember what chapter in the book of Acts, but uh, you do see the word Easter in the book of Acts, but that's actually a reference to the Passover and not to this holiday uh, Easter that they're debating on. So those were the, those were the two original um, items that wanted to be discussed and settled at, the, uh, at this council. But now you've got a, a new issue coming uh, 
a new issue is, has, come, has come about and, and it needs to be decided at this council concerning the teachings of Arius. And the uh, council itself is moved from Nicira and is moved to Nicaea. And I'll pull that up on a map. They're not all that far apart. Um, if you're looking at this map, right again, we're in, in modern day Turkey and Syria is right here. It later becomes one of the more important cities in the uh, Ottoman Empire, which we'll, we'll talk about them uh, more towards the end of class. But Ansira, uh, a pretty important city. This is originally where it was going to be held. Let me pull that up, make that bigger. Right, Ansira is the city here. Nicaea is simply, I believe, right in here. All right, so you're only talking about a, different, a distance of a few miles but now, instead of this just being a, bish uh, a meeting of the bishops, Constantine has sort of, uh, once this uh, has sort of inserted himself and made this maybe a little bit more of a, a special council than, than the council was originally thought to be. So, with the decision of Arianism, again, Constantine wanted this to be handled swiftly. Pull that back up. Again, the council's moved to Nicaea, wants to be handled swiftly, and there's a report about uh, how many bishops were in attendance. There's not an exact number. Depending on the writer, you're going to get different numbers. It is true that the emperor sent out invitations to essentially bishops throughout the entire, uh, through all the churches in Europe. Some estimate that to have been about 1,800 bishops. Uh, supposedly, um, depending on your on what was stated, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 300 bishops were stated to be there, but more than likely only 200 bishops or around that number were actually present for it. Most of these bishops came from the eastern Mediterranean area, right? Because that was where the heart of the controversy was at at that point. You do have some that come from pretty far away. Again, you know, the delegation that was sent originally, that bishop was from Spain. You've got some that come from modern-day France, which at that time was Gaul. Uh, as far east as Armenia, which is just on the outskirts of the empire. And the Bishop of Rome actually does not attend, but he does send some representatives for him there. And you might think of this as sort of like a gathering place of you know, bishops who are very refined, who um, are very concerned at this point about their, their appearance and things like that. Maybe... You know, maybe we think about, maybe, you know, within Catholicism today, the appearance of bishops and leaders of, of the Catholic Church, how neat and informal they look at times. But you have to keep in mind that a lot of these bishops are just coming out of a period, especially in the East, where they had faced a lot of persecution. And as one writer put, they probably still wore the scars of persecution. In fact, there was a story about one bishop in particular that came to the council and this bishop was from the uh, sort of the southern region of the, where the Nile River is at, so modern day Egypt. And he had actually faced persecution. He had lost an eye um, because it had been gouged out in the, in the process of being persecuted. Uh, and it was said that when the, the man appeared at the council, when he walked in, Constantine met him and kissed him in his eye socket, which is kind of weird. Kind of weird for us, but Constantine was trying to show as much favorability towards these bishops as he could. Constantine even showed that further because he's going to essentially foot the bill for the council. And what was said about this is that this was a very elaborate affair um, in terms of the type of food they ate was very uh, would have been the type of food that a king or an emperor would have would have ate. The housing was said to be very good, elaborate chariots, uh, things like that. I think one writer stated that, uh, one early writer stated that some of these bishops even received gifts, especially from the emperor for being here, uh, gifts that are very lavish and, and, and gifts that would have sort of been fit for a leading political figure. And so now, you know, with Constantine footing the bill, one of the things that this opens the door for is that church officials are going to become more involved with handling affairs of the state. And when you think about how that ties in with Catholicism, Catholicism eventually 
wields a lot of power over the kings of Europe uh, later on, and maybe this is where this begins to happen. The emperor and the, and the bishops are connected. The bishops are going to get more involved in the affairs of the, uh, the state moving forward because, again, of Constantine's promotion of Christianity within the empire. So, again, an open door for church officials to become more involved with the matters of the state. So the Council of Nicaea is planned. It, it now convenes with the bishops there in attendance. Um, and there are a lot of pictures that you can look at about this. Um, I should say they meet instead of the meet. Uh, what's said about it is they, that they met within an assembly room within a palace. Um, bishops sat parallel to the walls. The emperor um, would sit in the middle. The emperor originally was not going to sit in the middle, but the bishops sort of beckon or encourage him to sit in the middle while this is going on. And I'll see if I can pull up a picture you can find you can Google this and find pictures of the uh, of what the council looked like. Yeah, and it just depends on the artist's rendition of it. But I mean, you can take a look at some of these examples. So you've sort of got the emperor here, um, what I believe is the emperor here. You've got the bishops parallel to the wall. Um, Maybe this is, I'm not exactly sure who this would be, maybe an, an important bishop, but that's sort of the, the outline or, or how, maybe, how, maybe how it looked, uh, this, this council going on. They're not necessarily sitting around a table, but sitting in an open room where they can discuss all of these things. And again, Constantine is invited. He's a part of this. But there is a problem that happens, and that's because there is a trouble in communication because Constantine spoke in Latin, but these bishops were speaking in Greek. And Constantine is not a theologian as well. So Constantine, a lot of this is really going over Constantine's head. He's sort of sitting there, but what it appears to be is that he didn't necessarily understand everything that was being said, not just because of a language difference, but also because Constantine's not that familiar with Christianity. Um, and so you do have some trouble in communication due to the language differences. Nevertheless, the council convenes, it continues on. There's a lengthy discussion that takes place. Both sides are given the opportunity to present their arguments. There were some bishops that essentially part of their evidence was to talk about the confessionals that people made on the point of baptism, um, probably similar to something found in Matthew 28 where you, talk, where you read about you know, Jesus teaching the apostles to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Um, but these are just treated sort of as local confessions rather than being something that can be um, uniting uh, for all churches. One of the things that they did emphasize, though, they, when the council began, they did want to maintain the biblical language uh, when it came to discussing God and discussing Jesus. And as we'll read in a moment, I won't have this on PowerPoint, but I'll read to you what the Nicene Council, their, their official statement was. But it was, a, it was a good idea to try to maintain biblical language with the decision that they were making. And then when this decision was made, it essentially was a statement of uh, really a, what they called a statement of faith, and it ultimately rejected Arius and his teachings. And I'm going to pull up the statement of faith. And again, you can, you can find this on the Internet, Google it. Uh, and this is what it stated. It began, We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible. And now this is important because this is talking about the nature of Jesus with God. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten from the Father, only begotten, that is, from the substance of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one substance with the Father, through whom all things were made in heaven and on earth, who for us men and for our salvation came down and became incarnate, becoming man, suffered and rose again on the third day, ascended to the heavens, and will come to judge the living and the dead. So if you listen there, you know that it says, it specifically says that Jesus is begotten from the Father, or of the same substance as the Father. 
He is God from God, light from light, true God from true God. He is begotten, not made. Right? That's a rejection of Arianism because Arianism stated that Jesus was created. Again, through whom all things were made in heaven and on earth. That again, proving his deity. Um, that again, is a reference back to John chapter 1. Then at the end of it, the statement was given, those who say there was a time when he was not, Arianism, or before he was begotten he was not, and that he came from non-being or from another substance or being, or that he was created or is capable of moral change or mutable, these the Catholic and Apostolic Church anathematizes. Right, so that, listen to that last paragraph again. Those who say there was a time when he was not, when he didn't exist, or before he was begotten he was not, and that he came from non-being, essentially talking about Christ being created. That's the heart of what Arianism taught. These, the Catholic, the end of it being, these the Catholic or the universal and apostolic church anathematizes. Again, the word Catholic just means universal. And when it says Catholic, it's just simply saying that the collection of bishops that have come together to represent a single decision for the church, they have made this decision. And then, of course, the word apostolic, bishops putting their authority in what the apostles taught. Now, obviously, there's no um, biblical evidence for um, you know, a council in this nature taking place. But the point being is that the, 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 the decision, it says that those who teach Arianism, the church anathematizes or curses. Uh, Paul uses the word anathema in the book of Galatians, in Galatians chapter 1. And it just simply means let that man be accursed, or literally cut off, cut them off from the rest of the body. So people that taught Arianism were essentially, they were denounced, they were supposed to be cut off from mainstream Christianity. You know, what, what will later become Catholicism. So there, you, you do have Arius and a few bishops that actually refuse to recant their teaching, and they are essentially um, ostracized a little bit, but um, they're not going to go away forever. In part of the Council of Nicaea, you also see Antioch and Alexandria gain more power. So they're, we've talked about how they're, the, they're two of the five main congregations. This, in part, they gain a lot of power because of this council. At the same time, they do set a fixed date for Easter as well. And even though Arianism is denounced, that does not mean that Arianism will go away. In fact, it continues on later on. Um, when you talk about the legacy of Arianism. So again, it doesn't die away immediately after the decision. One of the interesting things about it is that Constantine is actually going to be baptized by an Arian bishop. And we'll talk more about that in the third lecture video. Not only is Constantine baptized by an Arian bishop, but some Roman emperors in the 4th century were, uh, will become, uh, if they're not Arian Christians, they're going to be uh, partial towards the Arian Christians. In fact, Valens, who's an emperor later on, is actually going to persecute the bishops that agreed with the decision of the council. And so uh, Arianism doesn't go away. And that's especially true when it comes to the role of Ophila, or Euphila, depending on how you want to pronounce that, who is called the little wolf. Now Euphila, Euphila or Ophila, uh, was uh, a missionary that took Aryan Christianity to the Goths. And this is not talking about, you know, people that dress in all black or, you know, that, that idea. The Goths were a Germanic tribe that was the, to the north of Constantinople, right? So Constantinople here, Ophila goes out and goes north to take Christianity to the Goths who are West, you see this area right here, north, and then farther to the east. Um, this southern portion is where the, uh, the Germanic tribe, the Goths, were located. And Ophila is going to take uh, Aryan Christianity to these areas. And 
convert some of the people there. And again, later on, when Rome is invaded uh, in the middle of the 5th century, uh, a lot of these people in this area, these Germanic tribes, have converted to Aryan Christianity. And there's sometimes the idea that these are, are barbaric pagans that invade Rome. These are actually uh, Aryan Christians. They, they held a different Christianity than, was, than what was being taught throughout most of the Roman Empire. But... Um, they held to a they held they held to the teachings of Arius, and that all began because of a man uh, and, and others, but especially main, a man named Ophila, uh, who took Arian Christianity to the West Goths, the East Goths, and and the Germanic tribes within this area. So Arianism is not going to die away, despite the decision that the council has made. In fact, one of the things that Ophila will do is that he's going to help the Goths create their own alphabet, and then having done that, he translates the Bible into their language. And so, uh, they're not going to go away. They still play an important role in the history of the Roman Empire, despite the decision that is made. Um, however, it appears, though, that at least for the time being, that a decision has been made, and that Constantine can sort of rest knowing that peace has been restored because this issue has finally been decided. Now, when you think about the modern-day equivalent, and they're not exactly equivalent, but there is a similarity in terms of that main teaching to the Jehovah's Witnesses, because the Jehovah's Witnesses do not think that Jesus Christ is uh, God in the same sense that God the Father is. And you can look in there how they translate John chapter one verse one. Uh, they they call Jesus a God rather than. Um, making him equivalent with God the Father, which is, again, what Arianism essentially taught. Jesus was a lesser form of God and was not equal in that sense to God. Uh, but with that being said, we will go ahead and stop here for the second part, uh, for the second lecture video. Again, the Council of Nicaea is important. It's one of the first ecumenical councils, which we'll talk about later on. Uh, but this is an important decision that uh, that Constantine first faces when he comes to know Christianity. And, uh, you know, Constantine, again, we see some important things, how he begins to insert himself into the affairs of the church, uh, which becomes something that, that is common later on. The church begins to get more involved in the state. And all of this is going on because of how Constantine has now opened the door. He's legalized Christianity, and, and it goes back to showing how Constantine is giving Christianity a public place within the Roman Empire, which will become even clearer when we talk about some things in the third lecture video. So this is one of the more important councils, and uh, I hope you're able to, to see its importance um, in, in terms of not just the, the doctrinal decision that, that's being made, but also how it affects the Roman Empire and even, even some of the Germanic tribes outside the Roman Empire. With well, that being said, we'll stop here. Thank you for your time and attention. Um, and I will upload the third lecture video a little bit later on today.